Well, this morning, we're going to be in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, a very, very well-known section of Scripture, a very familiar story to many of us. I want to read the Scripture first, and then uh, we're going to do a little commentary. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 3, we hear this. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling party or council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Well, many of us have heard this story before. I want to take a step back, but before I can take a step back, I remembered something I needed to tell my little Bible study group that is at my house tonight. We're having lasagna. Bring us out or lots of dessert. Okay. Keep a balance between the greens and the good things. So anyhow, with that having been said. Last week, uh, when I got through the sermon, I felt like I was getting a little long in the tooth, so I shut up at a certain point, and we concluded the service. But there was one more point I needed to make, and I think it fits well this morning. If you go back to chapter 2, the last three verses, 23, 24, and 25, it says this. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Now, in some ways, that passage seems a little almost cynical. That Jesus sees the darkness within people. Particularly the crowd that was there celebrating him. And again, we we know that people are drawn to positive things, good things, especially if they think that they can get some of them. Blessings, we call them sometimes. Things like physical healing or maybe perhaps prosperity. And Jesus knew that it wasn't what he was doing that was so important, the healings, the miracles. Although they are great blessings to people in their lives, The most important thing was what he would be doing later. And so I think that there's two things that this little passage teaches us. One, that Jesus, while he does miracles, and while we believe that he even does miracles today, when we pray for other people and we ask God to intervene, we believe that that is what should happen if it is his will. But that's not the reason that we come to Jesus. We come to him because we are broken, because we are people who need God in our lives. We need his grace and we need, most importantly, his salvation and the work 
that he did on the cross. Had he trusted himself to these people, as the scripture says, what do you think would have happened? He would have been able to build a great ministry. People would have come and gotten healed and they would have given him the adulation, the praise, and so forth. But would that really have met the need? Jesus had a road to walk that was not one of praise and adulation for what he was doing, but rather would bring glory to his Father through what he did on the cross. Just an important note for us to remember. And so when we enter into this story with Nicodemus, we have this sense from John that he wants us to look at the second thing that I think that's going on here, and that is Jesus, while he approaches Nicodemus, approaches him with a healthy sense of skepticism. What are you looking for, Nicodemus? Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and we're going to talk about that in a minute here. But remember, throughout the scriptures and Jesus' encounters with these religious leaders, oftentimes they were trying to entrap him by what he said so that they could prove that he was not from God and that they were the ones that Israel should look to, that people should look to for their instruction and their guidance, that they should be the ones who were allowed to have the power that comes with being at the top of the institution. So Jesus, I think, when he's approached by Nicodemus, is very true to himself. He shares the word. He shares three great spiritual truths in this particular passage with Nicodemus. We'll get to those at the end. But we need to back up a little bit and and get Nicodemus in perspective because we are going to encounter men somewhat like Nicodemus and other men who are different from Nicodemus, but they come from the same cloth. They're Pharisees. John Wayne once said, a man deserves a second chance, but keep your eye on him. And I think that when it comes to religion, when it comes to religion, we need to give it a second chance, but we need to keep our eye on it. Many of us are here this morning because we've had those religious experiences. The institution where things mattered more than people. Where customs and traditions overtook care and compassion, love and mercy where carpets meant more than the children that ran on them with their red Kool-Aid. Right? The establishment. The Pharisees began as a good movement. They were the men who stood in the gap. That when Israel had lost its way, They challenged society and the powers to be, the Greek and Roman world, and said, Israel is God's, and we will live as faithful people to him. And they grew out of a movement of people, I believe it was the Maccabees, who actually stood and died to give Israel a period of freedom. The Pharisees, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, contended for God's law of separation, especially barring non-Jews from the newly rebuilt temple and opposing intermarriage between the Jewish people and pagans, those who were not Jewish. In fact, the name Pharisee literally means the separated ones. In Hebrew, it has a correlation into the New Testament term, sanctify, separated, set aside for a specific purpose. 
during the intertestimonial period, that's the period after the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. When Israel was under Greek control, many Jews went out and went along with the pagan Greek programs. It was easier to get along than to not, right? But these Pharisees came through and said, no, our religion is a religion given to us by the revelation of God himself through Moses and the patriarchs and the prophets, and we are called to be faithful to God's law. They reinstated and gave great emphasis to teaching the Ten Commandments. And over a long period of time, they began to understand how important it was not to break the Ten Commandments. However, also over a period of nearly 400 years, the Pharisees went from heroes to hypocrites. How did it happen? At first, the Pharisees emphasized piety and obedience to God, devotion to God, a very good thing. But gradually, they developed their own distinctives, their own culture, their own way of doing things. They were so careful to avoid breaking God's commandments that they built what they called a hedge around Torah, Torah being the Ten Commandments. They built a hedge around Torah. It was, the idea was to protect people from breaking the Ten Commandments. And if you butt it up against this fence or this hedge, Instead of breaking the ten, you would break these rules here, and it wasn't nearly as serious. However, it became that. They were so careful to avoid breaking God's commands that they built a fence around them. They added 248 commandments and 600, or three, 365 prohibitions to ensure that you didn't break the original ten. Now just imagine for a moment... 248 new commandments and 365 prohibitions. You had to memorize these things. Remember, most of us at this period of time didn't read or write. The scholars did. The learned did. But the average Joe, you and I, probably wouldn't have been reading and writing. And to become a Pharisee, you had to memorize not only the Ten Commandments, and how many of you got those done, Pat? Okay. Just stack on nearly 600 new items to your memory. I can't remember yesterday, let alone this list of rules. Some of those rules are very interesting. They cover all sorts of things, including divorce. A man could divorce his wife as long as he wadded up a piece of paper that had the word divorce on it, threw it at her, and hit her with it. But she could not be inside her home. She had to be out in the front lawn. So you just imagine that little thing, you know, you're carrying around a wad of paper for several days because she won't come out. <laughs> I know what you're doing! <laughs> he could divorce her for a number of interesting reasons. The one that I find the most fascinating in the Mishnah, which is this collection of laws. You could divorce your wife if she put too much salt in your soup. Just keep that in mind, ladies. Hold it, I cook at home. I'm safe, aren't I? Or you're safe. I be, oh, oh, I'll watch it. They didn't demand at first that everybody accept their personal convictions. But with time, a narrowness crept in. Does that sound familiar? Isn't it funny how we build institutions, create something, and we start adding little rules to it? Anybody who started a business and started having to hire their first employer realizes that suddenly, You've got to give direction to this person the way you want them to do something. And so you start making little rules. You know, at first it's just show up at work on time. Then it boils down to 
how to do the job. And then the funny thing is, is it eventually boils down to how to do the job the way I want you to do the job. And then tomorrow, if I feel differently about it, I'm going to tank you because you didn't do it the way I thought you should have done it today, even though I told you how to do it yesterday. And that's true for religion as well, churches. We can see this parallel in the way that we've established our churches, even Christian churches that are based on grace and love and kindness, how we build things up to where people aren't really welcomed anymore unless they're just like us, right? Their traditions became laws. And gradually there was a shift away from God's spirit to the letter of their new laws. Godliness was no longer the measure of external compliance to the rules. Rather, those who did not conform were not accepted within the Pharisees. The Pharisees put an emphasis on externals because that's how we can really measure if you've got it, right? I mean, if you are a good Crestonite, you wear boots and wranglers, and you have a hat somewhere. Isn't that right? No? Oh, okay. You do come clothed. We do appreciate that. They wore special clothing that attracted attention to themselves. When a Pharisee entered into the room, you knew he was a Pharisee. A number of years ago, when I went into worship, I had to wear a large black robe, beautiful stoles, and a clerical collar. I was dressed differently than everybody else. And I was treated differently. At first, I was sort of treated with some great esteem. I was was viewed as a pastor. In fact, my title back then was reverend. But I noticed something else happened when I first was ordained. When I first started wearing the robes and the collars and all of that, I wasn't part of things anymore. And I remember being taught as that young pastor by my senior pastor how important it was that I be separate from and not a part of the church. And that felt lonely. And it felt uncomfortable. And it took me a good number of years to finally throw all that off and to realize I am nobody in this church like everybody is nobody in this church. I am somebody in this church just like everybody is somebody in this church. I just have a different set of gifts that God has given me. And without all your gifts, we wouldn't be a loving church. And that feels so much better. But the Pharisees didn't get that. They liked their special clothing. Jesus even declared that everything that they did was for show in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. They were proud of their spirituality and rigid in their positions. And what happens with that is you eventually lose perspective. You lose a sense of reality. You are this and everyone else is that. Remember the prayer that one man prayed, thank you God for not making me like him. That's what religion does to us. It makes us feel as if somehow we're better than someone else that God loves and died for. Jesus said that they strained at gnats and swallowed camels. Their emphasis was on the non-essentials, making the Sabbath a burden instead of a delight. They counted out the herbs of their garden in order to pay a tithe, but they were actually very materialistic. 
And Jesus knew that they loved money, Luke chapter 16, verse 14. But it was best not to get involved with all the business deals with them to avoid them. In fact, the very strongest language in the New Testament that Jesus uses is reserved and directed against the Pharisees. He said they were hypocrites, not practicing what they preached, Matthew 23, verse 3. Jesus was not impressed with their strictness. In their zeal to keep their rules, they were breaking God's law, Matthew 15, 3, if you're taking notes. What was once a movement towards holy living became a dead institution. By the days of Jesus, the Pharisees were a professional religious class of people. They probably did not number more than 6,000 in the entire population of Israel. And the perception of the day was that they were the holy people. But the common people felt it was impossible to live by their strict guidance. And that they were not part of the real world. Their legalism became a barrier that actually led to the damnation of those who fell under their influence. Matthew 23, verse 15. And while the people of Palestine in that day could have been divided into six or seven religious denominations or subsects, 90% of the people of that day did not identify with any of those groups. This is the stat that really impressed me because I want us to think about our churches today, while the people of Palestine could have been divided into six or seven religious denominations or subsects, 90% of the people did not identify with any group. Think of where the American church is today. We have large groups, we can kind of break them out, holiness groups, sort of Baptist and Anabaptist groups. Calvinist, non-Calvinist groups, Catholic versus Protestant. And for all the churches across all the cities that we have, how many of them are packed to the brim? How many homes are filled with people that are sitting around watching the Sunday morning news or sleeping in? And really, that, I think, is a sad commentary on the church because we've made it. We've made ourselves into a people distinct from other people for the wrong reasons. Not because Christ has given us life and we are willing to share it freely and love one another and accept each other with the grace that Christ accepted other people, but rather we have said, you're welcome here as long as you look X, Y, and Z. And we have our traditions and our rules and our laws. We have holy people who are out of touch with real life and real people. And then in steps the outsider. Is it any wonder that Jesus was so different so refreshing to people that in his early days of his ministry, people were running around saying, there's this guy that's teaching and his word is so different. It has an authority that's unlike anything we hear at the synagogue or the temple. There's a contrast between Jesus and the religious people of the day. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Luke chapter 4, verse 22. In the Gospels, Jesus is referred to as a teacher more times than any other title. Teacher or rabbi. The Greek word is often most associated or given to Christ as an educational title is... uh, I've always had a problem with this one, even in Greek class. Didikakos. Okay, I butchered it there too. Which is translated teacher or master. and is found nearly 40 times in the Gospels. Most frequently in the King James Version, if you still 
harken back to those days and read that particular version of the scriptures. The word master was translated instead of teacher. But it might not be the reason we think of. It wasn't about lordship. It was actually a reference to schoolmaster in the Greek or in the uh, Elizabethan English of the day. It still meant teacher. One with authority and one who taught. Jesus' disciples referred to him as master and teacher. The scribes and the Pharisees also referred to him as master and teacher. Jesus identified himself once with this title in Mark 14.14. 14. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where may I eat Passover with my disciples? That was the one time he referred to himself, and that was just before the Last Supper. Earthly and heavenly things. Jesus encounters Nicodemus. Nicodemus calls Jesus what? Teacher, rabbi. And Jesus gives Nicodemus three spiritual truths. One, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God. Now let's stop right there. The Pharisees and Nicodemus believe that you can see the kingdom of God if you do what? Perfectly live the Ten Commandments. And now, because of the length of their traditions, if you keep all 600-ish additional new rules. And they felt good about themselves, but you all not so much. So Nicodemus, in his head, believes that the way that you're going to see the kingdom of God, the way you're going to spend eternity with God, is if you are the master of your own destiny. If you have perfectly kept the Old Testament law. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. All of a sudden, Jesus the teacher hits this student. Because that's who Nicodemus is. Even though he's part of this ruling class, even though he's been separated, Jesus still has grace for Nicodemus. As I do think he does for all of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. Even though he knows that they have their agenda, even though he doesn't trust himself to them, he knows that they are still people who Christ will die for and who God will offer salvation to if they will simply have ears and eyes Ears that hear and eyes that see. I think that's an important thing that we need to stop and also remember for ourselves, folks. The most vile, radical, Islamic terrorist. The person most right now, our culture, is willing to despise and hate. That person Jesus Christ died for and offers salvation. That doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to the injustices that they are committing, but we should be praying for them. We should be asking that Jesus reveal himself to them and that somehow they might see his mercy and his truth. That doesn't mean that we don't stop or try to negate their injustice in this world. And sometimes that leads us to bloody confrontations. But we should be praying for our enemies. Jesus doesn't see Nicodemus as an enemy. He sees him as another soul who needs to know God's love. Very truly I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And this challenges Nicodemus to his very core. He thought he had it all nailed down. All all he had to do is obey the Ten Commandments and and the teachings that I've been giving, the traditions I live. I feel like I've got this in control. I'm good. 
How is one born again? Crawl back up inside of his mother's womb? Sure, his mom wasn't too excited about the prospect of that. But he's absolutely flummoxed. You have to be born again. And he goes into explaining that. Jesus says the second very critical spiritual truth. Truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. We believe that's a reference that the New Testament church and the writers of the Gospels put in there for us to understand that it meant baptism and the, begin, uh, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That baptism helps us to identify with Christ's death and his resurrection. Paul goes into a great deal of detail about that in the book of Romans, as well as other parts of the New Testament and of the Spirit. That we have to be indwelled with God's love by accepting Christ into our hearts. It can't just be an intellectual practice. We can't just say to ourselves, Jesus is a great teacher. And then pick and choose what teachings we're willing to adhere to. Rather instead, Christ has to come into our lives and indwell us. By faith we ask Him, Lord, I don't know how this happens. I don't understand what it is all the time. But Lord, live in me. I've known plenty of kids and my kids are just like them. Born into a Christian home. Being raised by Christian parents. We send our oldest to a private Christian school. All for the hope that they will one day be Christians themselves. But the danger in all that is they're surrounded by an institution. The institution of Christianity. As a wonderful institution in many ways. But the reality is that they have to make a decision to accept and follow Jesus Christ on a personal, heartfelt, life-changing basis. And that's not anything that I or the church or their Christian education can give them. That is only comes when the Spirit of God gets a hold of that young heart and they say, Jesus, I get it. I love you. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. If you were raised in the church, if you've always gone to church, have you ever asked Him that? Come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Because you see the problem here that Nicodemus has is he has 400 years of Pharisees behind him who've all told him how to be a Pharisee, but never told him how to be a living disciple of a holy God. And here, for the first time, he stands in front of a man who gives him this final spiritual truth. Skipping down, Jesus says that you have to be born of this Spirit and the Spirit blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, how can this be? Jesus chides him. You are Israel's teacher. You do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things and then this third spiritual truth? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. If you want real authority, it doesn't come from years of tradition of obeying your teachers and the teachers before them and all of the laws and all of the things you've written down for people to do. 
It is by being in the very presence of a holy God. And there's only one, only one, no matter how many great Pharisees there were before you, no matter how great prophets were in the Old Testament, no matter how great Moses was, there is one who surpasses them all. And it's the only one who stood in the very presence of God from time and eternity, who was and is and will be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And then Jesus says this, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. And He's speaking about His crucifixion and His death. About His resurrection. This is the one you have to look to. This is the one you have to have in your heart, in your life, in your mind. Give up all your rules. Throw away all the do's and don'ts. But rather, live with the one who can give you life in your heart. The one who gives you joy and peace. The one who breaks down every wall of division between you and God and you and others. When He lives in your life and His Spirit is your guide and your stay, then you have the opportunity, the privilege to be born again and to see the kingdom of God. These are the truths that we hold on to because they are life-changing and life-guiding truths. You don't have to wear cowboy boots to get into the kingdom of heaven although you'll look much better if you do. You don't have to wear a hat. You don't have to like country music. You can like any kind of music you like. It's not about our traditions, although we enjoy them and there's some value to them. They are, no more, they are never more valuable than the life we're trying to show Christ to. When our kids are too loud in the sanctuary, when they run through, just smile. When somebody comes in dressed a little differently, maybe has a funny accent, New England, I'm thinking of, just smile. When you see somebody whose heart is burdened because they don't know where to go, smile and give them Jesus. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that like Nicodemus and like the Pharisees, we have come up with our traditions, our way of doing things, things that make us feel comfortable and safe, and protect us from that big, bad, old, scary world out there. But Lord, help us to be genuine people. People who love deeply because we have been loved deeply. People of grace because we follow a gracious Savior. People of mercy because we have been given mercy. And people of the Spirit, because your Spirit lives within us. Father, I pray that we all know that Spirit. And we ask you, Father, that your blessing be upon us and with us. And the light in our hearts would shine to others. and They'd see our joy. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, stand with me. We're going to sing uh, one more song of praise and worship. I've been told that...